You are listening to Perplexity. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kadra, and today we have a listener requested story. This story was recommended by a listener and my friend, Bethany. Today we are going to be talking about Georgia's Lake Lanier, also known as one of the most dangerous bodies of water in the United States, and what many believe is one of the most haunted places in Georgia, if not the United States as well. Let's get into it. Trigger warning first and foremost for today's episode. Today we will be discussing some heavy topics that will be considered disturbing and upsetting to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised, especially for listeners below the age of 13, and I will be giving some specific triggers as we go throughout the episode. The sources for today's episode will all be available in the show notes. So, first of all, this just happened on July 27th, 2023. So, that's just a few weeks before I'm recording this. 24-year-old Thomas Milner was found unresponsive in Lake Lanier. They suspected possible drowning, and it was said that Milner jumped into the lake from his family's dock. Then he began screaming for help. A family friend tried to grab a ladder and rescue him, but this attempt was unsuccessful. Neighbors on a nearby boat then tried to help him as well, but as soon as they tried to pull him in to their boat, they felt this intense burning sensation. So they had to stop. They swam to shore, realizing the nearby power box was turned on. Milner had been electrocuted, and by then it was too late. Despite CPR and medical interventions, Milner would die the next day in the hospital. And as if this wasn't tragic enough, just two days later, a 61-year-old man would also be found in water that was 46 feet deep in the same lake. And it's said this man had jumped off his boat for a swim, but went underwater and did not resurface. This man was later found and identified as Tracy Stewart. The same evening, a 27-year-old man decided to also go for a swim. He jumped from his boat, went under the water, and did not resurface. The search for the 27-year-old's body is still ongoing. These are just three tragic stories of the deaths at Lake Lanier. The horrifying reality, though, is between 1994 and 2022 alone, it's estimated that 216 people have died in Lake Lanier. And just between 2018 and 2022, there have been 48 deaths, with 33 being identified as drownings and others not being specified in the sources I could find. If we go back even further to beginning of when this lake was first constructed, you'll find that from the construction to now, nearly 700 people have died in Lake Linear or around it. So what the hell is going on at this lake? Well, there's a lot of lore and theories around this lake. There's a lot of dark history. So let's go back to the beginning to better understand what could be going on here. So first of all, Forsyth County, which sits on the western side of where Lake Lanier is today, was once part of the Cherokee Nation during the 1800s. In the 1830s, the U.S. government expulsed most of its members from what would be one of the most southeasternmost regions of the Trail of Tears, and this was part of the Indian Removal Act. And then 80 years later, there was another expulsion. So these people were forcibly removed from their homes, and there was a lot of tragedy there. And if we know anything about the Trail of Tears, we know that a lot of Native Americans would die during this forced journey as well. This lake is man-made. It was built over this land during the 1950s. It's technically a reservoir. It's 
absolutely huge. And it's also sometimes called Lake Sydney Linear, which we're going to talk more about the name in a little bit because it took them a while to come up with this name. It was built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 1956, and it cost about $45 million to build. And construction for this had to be on hold for a while because of the Great Depression. They obviously didn't have the money for it for a while. When they would construct it, it would be absolutely huge. It's more than 38,000 acres of water and covers 690 miles of shoreline. At its deepest point, by the dam, the lake plummets to nearly 300 feet. There's tons of tourists as well that come here every year. It's estimated somewhere between, I think, 11 and 14 million that visit each year. And despite all of the deaths that have happened here, it's clearly still very popular. The lake was built along with Buford Dam in order to help control flooding, provide water to the locals, generate power to Gwinnett County, and it was obviously a good economic resource for the area. As a result of all of this being constructed, it would generate more than $97 million of electricity since 1957. If you look at Lake Linear on a Google map, you can also see a lot of overlooks, trails, piers, recreational areas, dozens of parks and beaches. So there's a lot to do, but with this lake being this massive, it shouldn't come as a shock that this would involve buying land and relocating families during its construction. So depending on the sources that you read, a lot of them will conveniently leave the history of Oscarville, Georgia out. But this is incredibly important and incredibly devastating history. More than 1,100 black people were displaced from the town of Oscarville. Hundreds of families, dozens of businesses were there, as well as 20 cemeteries, including sacred cemeteries of slaves. You see, before Lake Lanier was built, we had the town of Oscarville. And Oscarville was a thriving, predominantly black community. They had a lot of great businesses. They were very close knit. These people were all forcibly displaced and Oscarville ceased to exist. Oscarville was originally formed in the late 1800s during the reconstruction era. There were a lot of carpenters, blacksmiths, bricklayers and farmers in the town. And farming was doing incredibly well here especially compared to the rest of Georgia. But this would all change in the year of 1912. There were alleged sexual assaults of two young white women in the area, and this would sweep the town. The first sexual assault involved a 22-year-old white woman named Ellen Grice, who would later accuse two black men of this attempted rape. The sheriff would arrest five black men for the alleged crime. Then, just one week later, on September 9th, 1912, another young white woman named May Crow, who was just 18, was found beaten and bloodied in the woods. She was dead, and it was believed that she had succumbed to her injuries and she had been sexually assaulted. She was found near Oscarville, and that night, white mobs known as Night Riders came in and drove many of the black people out of Oscarville. Four black people would be implicated in the crime, including 16-year-old Ernest Knox, his 18-year-old cousin Oscar Daniel, 22-year-old Trussie Jane Daniel, who was Oscar's sister, and 24-year-old Robert, known as Big Rob Edwards. It's said that authorities found allegedly a pocket mirror belonging to Ernest Knox uh, near the victim, and they considered that evidence. But from another source that I read, Ernest Knox was being interrogated. He was being manipulated by the police. They were scaring him. They put a noose around him to mock him, and basically they were like, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't confess. So, without shock, 16-year-old Ernest Knox is absolutely terrified, and he confesses 
to a crime that most people today believe he in no way committed. And I mean, he's 16 years old. And when he would confess, they would arrest these other family members. Robert Edwards was arrested, and a day later, a a white mob would invade his jail cell. And trigger warning for anyone listening, um, we're going to get into some horrible violence. So a white mob invaded Robert Edwards' jail cell. They dragged him through the streets on a wagon. Then they strung him up on a telephone pole and a bunch of the white townspeople gathered around and shot bullets into him. And they just left his body hanging up there. So disgusting, horrific. And not long after this, the Knight Riders would show up in Oscarville, which the Knight Riders were basically like the KKK. They had a bunch of guns, and they went around the town on horseback, and they started shooting into all of the buildings. They had one goal in mind, basically to run out as many black people as possible from Oscarville by any means necessary. So, again, trigger warning. They would set the businesses on fire. They threw firebombs into the church. And Oscarville wasn't really the same after this. Many black citizens of Oscarville also died during this attack, either trying to escape and find solace in Gainesville by drowning, or they were lynched, murdered, etc. In October of 1912, a jury, after just a little over an hour of deliberation, convicted Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel for May Crow's death. Trusty Daniel's charges were dismissed, and 5,000 people would gather to watch these two teenage boys be hung. And as if this wasn't horrifying enough, they wanted to see these two young black boys being tortured. So they, um, there was like a wall that had been built that was supposed to like keep the hanging private, and I can't remember who, but there were either some night Riders or a white mob that like set the wall on fire so that everyone could come see these two boys being murdered. So, um, and it's widely believed that these kids were completely innocent of this crime. So it's, it's pretty freaking horrifying that this happened, but at the same time, it's not surprising, right? Um, So 98% of Oscarville's Black residents were either forcibly relocated or murdered during this time, and the once thriving Black community became a ghost town. The grounds were bathed in blood, and the land was then sold to the government. So we're already off to a very horrible start. And the U.S. Army would claim that they were very careful during the construction of this lake, ensuring that all of the graves of the dead in those 20 cemeteries I had mentioned earlier would be dug up, moved, and reburied. But I find it pretty hard to believe that they would be able to dig up 20 cemeteries and keep those graves intact and the headstones and move them all. And I find it pretty hard to believe that they would care enough to do so, especially since a lot of these graves were of black people and of slaves. And another reason I believe this is because when they would finish building the lake and they would finally name it, they named it Lake Linear, named after Sydney Linear. And Sydney Linear was a musician, a poet, and a Confederate soldier. So this just kind of illustrates the whole founding and, like, beliefs, the underlying racism here. It's just insane. This lake would be filled, and it would literally just send Oscarville underwater. Many people say Lake Lanier is haunted, which makes sense with the disrespect of the dead, Um, with the racial tensions, with the murders that happened here, all of the tragedy with the Trail of Tears. And there is an incredibly high number of drownings that have occurred here, 
It's considered one of the most dangerous bodies of water in the United States. This seems to be largely because there's a lot of debris in the lake as well. I mean, they just left a whole freaking town there and filled it with water and kind of hoped for the best. Officials say an entire town can be found under the water, including trees that are 60 feet tall. So they had this rule where as long as the top of the trees didn't exceed like 35 feet deep in the water, like if you dove 35 feet, then you would find the trees. They were like, that's deep enough, that's good. So they just left these super tall trees there. There are also sunken boats under the water, like ferry boats that are really freaking old. There's lawn chairs, there's fishing wire, bridges, toll gates, and historical landmarks. You can even find an old auto racing track known as Looper Speedway. The speedway was lost until 2007 when there was a really bad drought in Georgia and this caused the water levels to lower so dramatically that it exposed some of the remains of Looper Speedway. The bleachers from the speedway were removed because they were seen as a safety hazard, but they left everything else. (laughs) In addition to all this debris, many divers have explored Lake Lanier, and they claim to have found headstones in the lake and dead bodies. So, um, I'm gonna assume that they didn't dig up all these graves like they claimed. These graves were unmarked and left behind with no one to claim them, so a lot of people think that they would have just left them there. That makes sense, but don't lie about it. And if we have learned anything in any of my haunting episodes, it's You don't disrespect the dead, and you don't desecrate these graves. So in 1958, just two years after the lake was finished being built, there were these two women that were driving in a 1950 Ford sedan on the Dawsonville Highway just over Lake Lanier. The driver was a woman named Susie Roberts, and she suddenly lost control of the car. We don't know why but she drove off the linear bridge and Roberts, along with the passenger, a woman named Delia May Parker Young, plunged into the 90 foot deep water. Both were presumed dead. And a year later, a fisherman found a body floating near a bridge. The body was so badly decomposed and missing its hands So, investigators were unable to identify the remains, but it was clear that this was a female. Additionally, the body was still dressed in a blue dress, and it's said that Young had borrowed the blue dress from Roberts the night before. 30 years later, in 1990, a construction crew would find the 1950s Ford sedan, Inside were the remains of Susie Roberts. It's believed that Parker Young was the female that was found floating and that she haunts Lake Lanier, and she has become known as their Lady of the Lake. Many believe she's out with a vengeance, and she has been cited by a lot of locals. She has been seen wandering the Dawsonville Highway Bridge in her blue dress, missing her hands. Another ghost named Agnes has also been seen near Lake Lanier, though her origin has a lot of contradicting stories. Like some people say that she was a woman who hung herself at the local university, and other people say that she was a swimmer at the lake and drowned. And there's another tale that describes an incident in 1903 resulting in 88 people dying, and some believe that these people haunt the area. Whatever the case, we know this for sure. Many strong swimmers have been lost in these waters, even when they were close to shore in calm water. Some people who have survived near drownings have claimed they felt like they were being dragged beneath the water by invisible hands. Others who visit the lake claim to get a sense of eeriness, 
feeling like the water is watching them. Some people claim to hear church bells from a sunken church. And divers have reported sightings of catfish as big as Volkswagen. In 2017, there was a diver named Buck Buchanan who told media he felt body parts in the lake during his many excursions. He would be reaching out into the dark, you know, to take a stroke because the water's so thick, you can't see in front of you. And when he would go to swim, there would be times that he would claim that something would grab him and it would just be a lifeless arm or leg. Which, if that ever happened to me, I would never be in these waters again. You, you couldn't even catch me looking at that lake. I would be out of there. Other locals have claimed that at night, they sometimes see a mysterious raft floating in the lake. And there's a shadowy figure manning this raft holding a lantern, pushing the raft along with a pole. And to me, this makes me think of like the Grim Reaper protecting his death cemetery and claiming whoever dares to go in those waters next. In January 1987, Hosea Williams attempted to lead a unity march in Forsyth to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and he was met with white counter-protesters and violence. He reattempted a week later and was joined by over 20,000 marchers at Cummings Courthouse, the same place where Edwards was lynched. The demographics soon shifted after all of this, and by 1990, the vast majority of the people residing in Forsyth County were Latino. So many of the deaths in this area have been of people in the Latino community. And so some people wonder if this could be part of why these deaths continue to happen and the safety regulations haven't gotten any better. It's like these people have been seen as disposable. So makes sense to me. A lot of people, though, are fed up with the lack of safety regulations in this lake. It's so large. The water is so dark and murky. And this makes search and rescue missions very difficult. BUIs or boating under the influence is also very common here. There's a lot of kids who apparently don't wear life jackets on this lake. And many people have advocated for the lake to be drained, cleaned, and restored. Tamika Foster, the ex-wife of Usher, even started an online petition, which over 6,000 people have signed, in response to her son's death. Foster lost her 12-year-old son at Lake Lanier. He was a boy named Kyle Glover. And in 2012, he tragically died after he was struck by a jet ski while he was just floating in an inner tube. Glover was the stepson of Usher. Despite the millions of visitors each year that Lake Lanier gets, it does not explain the high number of fatalities. Because other lakes, like Lake Alatuna, a nearby lake that gets nearly the same number of visitors each year, had just one third of the deaths. But of course, there is also the theory that there are ghosts in the water that pull swimmers and boaters under as revenge for how they were treated while they were alive. There's also, of course, a very dark history to how this lake was built, and there was a lot of tragedy there in 1912 and in the 1800s, well before the lake's construction. Perhaps the lake is cursed. From the Cherokee removal to the banishment and murders of black people, there could be hundreds of disembodied souls here. I think it's best to end with a quote from Lisa Russell, an author and historian. Quote, a haunting is sometimes defined as something that is difficult to ignore or forget, something that is poignant and evocative. The real haunting in this story is how history has made it impossible to ignore what was done to the land in North Georgia. Once a land of wild rivers, North Georgia is now broken with dams and human-made bodies of water that changed the ecosystem. Once a land that belonged to indigenous people, it is now buried under the water, making recovering of lost culture impossible. End quote. Whatever the case, 
This story is certainly perplexing. And that is the story of the allegedly haunted Lake Lanier, the lost city of Oscarville, and the story of Lake Lanier's Lady of the Lake. So what do you guys think? Do you think this lake is cursed, haunted? Do you think it's just insanely dangerous and they need to get rid of it entirely? Do they need to clean it, drain it? Have you ever been to Lake Lanier? Let me know. I would love to hear your thoughts. Send me an email at perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. And if you've been enjoying the podcast and you haven't done so yet, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube. It helps so much for small independent podcasters like me. Or if you are listening on the podcast and you haven't done so yet, please leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. Each time that you hit that star rating option and leave a good review, it puts this podcast in front of dozens of other listeners. Thank you so much for listening. You all are amazing. I will talk to you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. Hosted, written, and produced by Kadra Brennan. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell the world about it by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leaving a five-star review. It helps the show more than you know. Contact, support, and merch links can be found in the episode description. And if you have a story to share or a topic request, send an email to perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. Cager would love to read your story on the podcast. Until next week, stay curious.